Hi guys and welcome to the podcast. I am of course your host and podcast founder Lawrence Francis. I just want to take this opportunity to give you a quick overview of this series which features coverage of the Dublin Wine and Cheese Festival which took place at Ivy Gardens in central Dublin between the 8th and the 11th of August 2019 which will air on the Interpreting Wine podcast between episodes 289 and episode 300. This will feature a mixture of talks and one-to-one interviews with some of the leading lights in the Irish and international wine scene. This consumer fair is now in its second year and I was seriously impressed with the quality of speaker overall. I think that events of this type really lend themselves well to being covered for the podcast. I would love to feature more events of this kind in the future. So without further ado, here is today's episode of the Dublin Wine and Cheese Festival 2019 series. Today's episode of the podcast features Claire Gallagher of Green Man Wines giving her talk on unusual grape varieties. We get an insight into why she chose this topic and what is it that fascinates her about these grape varieties. before tasting through four indigenous grape varieties enjoy so uh, my initial title for this was uh, far from merla we were raised and i realized that probably didn't really express properly what i really wanted to talk about which was this resco- di- rediscovering lost traditions and heritage grape varieties and the the reason why i wanted to talk about this was because i read an article Uh, a couple of months ago um, by Jancis Robinson MW who writes among other things many other things is the wine correspondent for the Financial Times and she had done a she in in one of their tastings she said I make absolutely no apology for having it as a theme the theme of heritage grape varieties there is an incredible kind of just just thirst for tasting new grape varieties for discovering what is local and traditional and i think that is for me i think that is really something that we we kind of i think we're all a little bit tired of kind of like the homogenization of 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 culture really you know we can go to any city in the world and it all feels very samey we can drink a, a bottle of merlot uh, and it can taste the same whether it comes from chile or it comes from southern france or it comes from south africa so there's been a whole raft of of winemakers i think really from about the ni- the late 1980s 1990s and this whole movement of um lower intervention more organic and biodynamic viticulture and less intervention in the cellars and actually rediscovering heritage and the things that make them unique has become really really prevalent and that's really gained uh, enormous momentum in the last 10 years Um, and for that reason I just think I just pick four wines that I think really illustrate um how exciting the wine world is now. Um the first one we're going to try is um a, a prosecco col fondo. I don't know if you've come across the style before. Uh but it's the way prosecco would have been made prior to uh the kind of the the, the kind of mass market proseccos really. And I'll explain a bit why that you know why why it's interesting and and how it's possible to make prosecco really kind of cheaply and and kind of get it out there very uh to the market. Um another one that we're going to try is a very unique wine from Tenerife in uh it, which is in the Canary Islands uh, off the coast of Africa. Uh I also want to show a Spanish another Spanish wine made from a great variety called Bobal which almost died out. Uh and then finally um a great variety called Pais which was brought to South America by the conquistadors in uh the in the 1550s and that almost died out as well so really that can give you a little bit of a flavor of what's going on in the wild wine world so we're looking at prosecco at the moment so it's from a producer called uh, Viña San Lorenzo um and they're based as all prosecco producers are in the Veneto region of northern Italy Uh and prosecco is a, it's it's fascinating. I mean everyone has ta- I guarantee every one of you have drunk a prosecco in the last year or at least you know talked to someone about having a glass of prosecco. It's a phenomenal success story on the export markets. Um and the reason for that is because producers can make it really cheaply and really easily using a method called the Sharma method. It was um so what it is is grapes are picked and put into huge tanks 
fermented, and then a little bit of sugar and a little bit of yeast is added into those huge tanks called autoclaves or Sharma tanks. And the whole process happens in bulk. So you can have enormous quantities of Prosecco that have been, that have been fermented in bulk and then bottled under pressure. And it means that you can get it out to the market at a really reasonable price. I mean, most Prosecco in the Irish market is around about 15 euros. And that's also helped by the fact that uh, the Irish government here doesn't charge uh, sparkling wine duty. So they charge table wine duty. So that's one of the reasons for the big disparity between a fully sparkling wine um, and a Prosecco. So it, instead of being charging fa almost six euros for a bottle of fully sparkling wine, the Irish government charged 3.20. Um, at, at kind of an excise duty. What I wanted to show you with this called Fondo is a very, it's a, a very rare bottle fermented kind of style. And this is the style that would have been made prior to Prosecco becoming really, really popular on export markets. So this is the ancestral method really. Uh, so what happens here, the wine is fermented. This is, you can see the list of grape varieties here. I mean, most Prosecco is made from a grape variety that is now called Glera, and it must be 85, oh, thanks, Mary. 85% of Glera, whereas this is a blend of Glera and all these wonderful indigenous grape varieties that you rarely see bottled uh, anywhere, let alone kind of uh, uh, in, a, in a single bottling. Um, so what happens, these grapes are brought in, they're pressed, they're crushed, they're, they're, everything is done to do an initial fermentation. And in the springtime, they, in April, when the weather starts to warm up again, they will just simply bottle the, 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 grape, the grape juice. They won't do anything to it. They don't add sugar, they don't add lab yeasts or any, any, any intervention whatsoever. So as the weather warms up, the yeast start to reach an optimum uh, fermenting temperature and they start to work in the bottle. Uh, and you get the secondary fermentation in the bottle. And in fact, the official name for these wines, instead of called fondo, which means with the leaves or with everything still left in the bottle, is refermentato in bottiglia. And that's literally refermented in the bottle. So that's, that's a good way to remember. I think it's a better way for us to remember um, what, what these wines are actually about. As you can see, it's very cloudy, um, and that's because the yeast are still present in the bottle. They're not, they're not taken out. Nothing happens. Once that bottle is capped, nothing else happens except the fermentation. So what you get in this is the yeast are still present, uh, the carbon dioxide is trapped in it, and that makes it very, very lightly sparkling, so frizzante. Um, and I absolutely love these kind of wines. I just think they're so interesting. They're really intriguing. I, I, you might go, God, that's not Prosecco at all as I know it. I mean, Prosecco's clear and it's bright. It's not cloudy like this is. It looks like funky apple juice. And in fact, it actually tastes, those wild yeasts actually make it taste a little bit like funky apple juice as well. You get slightly cidery, slightly kind of apple -y flavors from it. And I also get, also get a lovely kind of, not so much in this one in the cold Talmary, but in another one that I'm familiar with, a really kind of like a quinine, almost like, do you know the San Pellegrino um, Aranciata? You know the little orange San Pellegrino bottles of orange juice? There's like, like a slightly quinine kind of flavor to them, or tonic water flavor. They're, and I get that from, quite, uh, from, from these kind of Proseccos. Food-wise, you can pair these with food. You can drink it as an aperitif. You can drink it with starters. Um, you can drink it with any kind of, any throughout the meal, really. And you can drink it in two ways as well. So you can stand the bottle up and let all the yeast settle to the bottom and effectively decant it off the leaves that are left and drink it as a clear wine. But I think it's much nicer with this, with all the leaves, all the kind of funkiness still in it. To me, it's like, it's, it's like apple juice with all the all this goodness left in it. Um, these wines are incredible on the Asian markets as well. Um, Japanese and Korean customers in particular love these wines. And they, they, even though they're made in small, small quantities, um, the Italian producers literally go, we could sell everything to Japan or Korea. And the reason for that is these are umami flavors. Uh, they work incredibly well with fermented foods, which, is, which are so popular now. Um, and we see them in restaurants across Ireland as well. Um, so I'm interested to know what you guys think of it. Do you like it? Oh, okay. Ah, oh, lovely. Excellent. Uh, what do you think? You like it? Ah, that's good, that's good. Would you order a bottle of this in a restaurant if you came across it now? 
No, <laughs> that's fair enough. Why, why not? Fair enough. Yes. 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 And that's a really good point, actually. It is quite cidery, and it's like a refreshing cider. You're, and that's and that's a. You can you can deliver with story. I need to learn the story. Yes. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. But it's an interesting one to not be what you said for Martha. Yes. I remember it's a great way not to be funny. Yes, yeah. I just need to be brave enough to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. And I think it's such a valid point. Because when you're dining Yeah. When you're dining with other people you want you you don't want to choose something that's like it's all about me and my choices. It's it's about <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Super, thank you. Okay, lovely. Will we try the next one? Okay. The next one I'd really like to show you is um, a really unique, really unique one. So, as I was saying, it is from Tenerife in the Canary Islands. So the Tenerife lies only about 100 kilometers off the west, off the west coast of Africa. And it has a really unique climate. Um, we, I, I'd actually never been to Tenerife before March of this year. Um, it, was, it was somewhere, to be frank, that I'd, I'd never really had any kind of desire to go to. But these wines are becoming incredibly sought after, uh, on, particularly with really forward-thinking sommeliers. And uh, the, the Irish importer said, listen, we're going to visit these people. They're really, really interesting, really good. Would you like to come? And we're like, for sure, let's, let's go and uh, explore this. So their vineyards are in the very northern part of the island. Most of the, most of the kind of the, the holiday maker part of it is on the southern part of the island. And really, really nice, actually, really lovely. But we traveled across um, towards the, the volcano El Tede, which is actually the highest point in Spanish soil. Um, and we traveled up to the northern part of the island. So it's really green, really lush vegetation. And they call it, there they call it, they call them Vinos, Vinos Atlanticos. So they're, they're Atlantic, they're Atlantic influenced wines. Um, you get really kind of, um, you get high altitudes and you get very cool breezes coming in off the Atlantic. And you also have to deal with humidity. And the other thing that's really interesting about it is their volcanic soils. So, because all those Canary Islands are effectively, they're, they're made from vul volcanic eruptions, really. Um, so that's really interesting uh, implications for the type of vines that grow and, uh, and the way that they grow as well. And the other thing that's really interesting about this is because where the location in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, it would have been on the trade routes from people going from Spain to South America. Um, and a bit of relative isolation meant that the grape varieties that grew there were never grubbed up. So when all this race in the kind of 80s and 90s for Parker points, I don't know if you've heard of Robert Parker. Uh, Robert Parker is a very, oh thanks Murray, a really influential American wine critic. Not so much now, his influence has waned a little bit, but certainly during the 80s and 90s, the vast majority of winemakers made wines to please his palate. So you had these really technologically driven wines, uh, which were like, okay, what do our customers want? They want big full-bodied wines, they want lots of fruit, they want lashings of new oak, they want lots of extraction, and they want Merlot and Cabernet and Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc. Because those, because those islands were really isolated and difficult to work, the local grape varieties were never grubbed up. So you've got grape varieties now that are, are completely irreplaceable, completely priceless. Um, so the grape variety used to make this is a grape variety called Listan Blanco, which is also known as Palomino Fino to make sherry. Um, and the vines themselves are over 100 years old and they've, been never, they've never been grafted onto rootstocks. So I don't know if you know about this, but in the middle 19th century, there was a, a big bug outbreak called Phylloxera. It was a little, a little louse that, would, would, that pretty much destroyed the rootstocks of European vines. And the vast majority of wines that we drink today are all on, on they're all grafted. So they're grafted onto louse-resistant rootstocks, usually American rootstocks. 
these vines have never been grafted, so they're completely unique in the world. Um, and they're over 100 years old as well. And the other unique thing about them is that they're, made, they're, they're on this, and I'll show you a picture. I have a picture on my phone if you want to have a look afterwards, on this training system called the Cordon Trenzado. And that's where Trenzado comes from, the name Trenzado comes from. And you've got these like 10 meter long braided vines that stretch up and down the hills. It's fascinating. I definitely come and look at the photo. It's really, really nice. Um, and when we were there, the, the, the vineyard workers were actually tying the new shoots onto the old, onto the previous year's um, growth. And they're literally hundreds of little tyings. You can imagine how labor intensive that is. And there were about six vineyard workers doing that when we were there. So, and the other thing I absolutely, that blew me away about this place was the fact that they, they actually had been, the producers had been under pressure to grub up these vines, which are, are completely priceless. You can't replace these. Because um, I don't know if you've ever tried little, um, I think they're called papas arugas, they're little Canarian potatoes. Well, they grow quite widely in the Canaries, and um, in the in kind of old times, they would have been grown underneath all the vines. So everything would have been a polyculture. So there would have been vines for home consumption. There would have been potatoes growing under it, vegetables, all that kind of thing. And as you know, if you've ever visited a vineyard, most vineyards are literally row upon row upon row upon row of monoculture, vine monoculture. Um, and these, these vineyards really were at, at risk of being grubbed up, not for a monoculture, well, for a potato monoculture, really. So that to me was really kind of shocking that something as, as this kind of heritage would actually be dispensed with, just, well, for commercial reasons, I guess. But anyway, so I love this because it's, it's re you get a real sense of where it comes from. You get that saline quality, you get the volcanic character coming through in the in it in the nose of it it's kind of really flinty really kind of smoky do you pick that up do you, do you taste it really smooth yeah yeah okay great um, really mineral as well uh, you get that and bone dry absolutely bone dry actually these these wines have just arrived in the country this vintage we've, we've been on the 2017 vintage just about eked out the last couple of bottles of it to last and the 2018 vintage literally landed yesterday or the day before. So this is my first taste of the 2018 vintage. But it's lovely. And this will soften out a little bit in the bottle. At the moment, it's really steely, really crisp, really kind of very linear. And as it gets a little bit of maybe six months to a year in the bottle, it'll soften out a bit. But you'll still get that acidity. You'll still get that freshness. What do you think of it? Do you like it? OK. Great. What about, yeah? No, no bitterness at all. No, that's a delicious wine. Okay, so the, the next one we're going to show is actually the last wine on the list, but it's a little bit lighter than the, the Clos Lohen, so we'll show it next. So this, the, this wine has only been imported into Ireland probably in the last two, two to three years, I'd say. And it's made by a young guy called Leonardo Erasso. And he uh, really came to fame as being one of the, the top winemakers for Argentinian Malbec, for one of the really, really good Argentinian Malbec producers. And he wanted, he wanted to do something that was really unique. Um, and he discovered he was traveling down in the Itata Hills, which lie just north of the city of Concepcion in Chile. And he discovered, he's discovered all these little farmers um, who had old bush vines. So bush vines effectively, you know the way if you go to a vineyard and you see the, the vines all trained on wires? These are different. These are like, they grow like little shrubs almost. So they're old bush vines. Never been irrigated, over 100 years old, and again, ungrafted. And actually, in, in like, like the previous one, also grown on volcanic soils. So the reason why he called this project a Los Vineteros Bravos is because he wanted to pay tribute to all these small farmers who had never again had resisted the temptation to grub up these, this priceless vine heritage and had never, you know, had just said, look, this is what we do. We're not going to use chemicals on them. We're not going to irrigate them. We're just going to produce good fruit and we'll just, we'll drink them ourselves or we'll sell them to our neighbors. They had no, ambitions whatsoever to, in, to export anything. 
And what you get, to me, is a real sense of Southern Chilean terroir, for want of a better word. I don't know if you've heard of the concept of terroir. It's a, it's a French word which means um, the, that really unique way that humans and land and culture and heritage all interact. Soil, climate, oh, thanks, Mary. Soil, climate, every, all interacts to produce a really, really unique product that can't be replicated elsewhere. So in, a, in an Irish context, I mean, think about, think about Loch Naeels, for example. You can't replicate Loch Naeels elsewhere, or you can't replicate one of the really great Irish, Irish cheeses elsewhere. You know, you can't, you can't take uh, great Irish dairy produce and plonk it maybe in the middle of Germany. It's just not going to work because the climate's different, the culture's different. All those things are different. So this is a bit like that. Um, what else? Oh, the other thing. Um, when I when I was studying Wine and Spirit Education Trust exams, when I started out in the wine trade, the one thing we were told was, was this great variety, Pais or Mission, which was brought, as I said, to America and South America by the conquistadors in the 16th century, that it was, it was a kind of a low quality great variety that was just really for, for local consumption. But for me, okay, it's not a great wine. It's not gonna last for years and years and years, but it's just deliciously drinkable and it's got a real sense of place. And that's why I love it. That's why I think it makes it really, really interesting. So, and this to me is much more interesting than a, a technologically driven Merlot from, from say some vast factory that's just gone, okay, what do our customers want? They want, yeah, fruit, yeah, a bit of oak, yeah, bit of softness, we'll add a little bit of something in there to make the mouth feel really soft and really pleasant. To me, you can make that anywhere. Uh, whereas this wine, it's completely unique and it's something that can, whether you like it or not, you can't deny that it's, it's uniqueness. Um, what, what do you think of it? It is very different, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. And which, which is a great thing. And it's, and, and that's, it, it doesn't have to be something that you like, but it's definitely a new, a new taste experience, which is important, I think, isn't it? Okay. So, and then we'll do the last one. Okay. So the last one is made by a guy who's only 40, 42 years old, and he's already got over 20 vintages under his belt. So it, he's Juan Antonio Ponte. And his father, I, I met him, actually I met him down at that, uh, on that trip uh, to Tenerife back in March. Lovely young guy, very unassuming. Uh, his father was a truck driver and he traveled all over Europe uh, in his truck. And they had always had small, uh, small family vineyards. And Juan Antonio grew up with these and he was like, listen, Dad, I, I love this. He trained as a winemaker. He was actually the youngest certified winemaker ever in Spain. And by the age of 20, he was already producing his first vintages. Um, and what he said, what he realized was, again, a priceless heritage of these old, uh, old plots of a great variety called Bobal. And Bobal really doesn't grow all that many places except for around this area, which is between um, La Mancha um, which is the, the, the kind of the region which surrounds Madrid and Valencia on the coast. So it lies kind of on that diagonal between Madrid and Valencia. Um, and he, he, he kind of realized looking, I mean, that's a wonderful thing about all these young winemakers. They travel a lot, they see what's out there and they, they come back home and they go, my God, you can't replicate this. So consequently, he's become known as the Prince of Bobal. And Bobal is a great variety, is, has always been said it's a bit rustic, it's not very interesting, it's not very exciting. But he was like, listen, he goes, Dad, sell your truck because we are going to make wine that's going to, that's going to work, that's going to really do well around the world. And that's what he's done. Um, he only grows Bobal, he's staked his reputation on it and he's consequently known as the Prince of Bobal. And what he does, this is his entry level bottling, it retails at 16 euros. And I just think it, I just think it absolutely blows the socks off. A lot of things you can get for 16 euros. Um, so it's, it's kind of, yeah, really fruity. Bit of interest there as well, a bit of complexity. 
a little bit rustic. I mean, you get lovely kind of plum skin and spice kind of characters to it. Really, really smooth, really supple, uh, and lovely freshness. These, the vines for this, again, they're bush vines, and they grow at 800 meters altitude. And I can tell you, at 800 meters altitude, it's, re it's quite cold. Even if down at sea level, it's roasting warm. Once you go up to about 800 meters above sea level, you really, you've got a cold climate. And that's really important for producing really good quality wines because you've got lots of warmth during the day from the sun, but at night time, temperature drops precipitously and you get that lovely freshness. So altitude is the key here. Uh, and careful winemaking, you know, organic, organic biodynamic viticulture. Uh, um, and I, I actually ordered this, uh, I was out with a friend of mine about two or three years ago actually, and we were in a restaurant, didn't know what to order. Like, like yourself, I, I didn't want to order something that she wasn't going to like. And I was like, okay, I know the Clono Hen is going to work and it's a good price point. And she was like, what is this? It's fantastic. Fair play to you for ordering something that's actually, that actually is really, really enjoyable and really pleasant to drink. So what do you, what do you sell? What do you think of it? Yeah. Great. Super, super. Would you order this in a restaurant? Yeah, good. Good, yeah, I would too. But listen guys, thanks a million. Um, if, I can, if I can show you the picture of those Cordon Trenzados or you wanna ask me any questions, I'm around, so please do, I'd love to, love to chat to you. Uh, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, for appearing. I really enjoyed hearing about these lesser-known grape varieties and how some of them are enjoying a new lease of life with the younger generation. Do be sure to check out Green Man Wine's website and social media handles below. And while you're at it, come and check me out on social, where I'm at Interpreting Wine on Instagram and Facebook, at Wine Podcast on Twitter, and email hello at interpretingwine.com. It's double Claire Gallagher on the podcast as she's appearing next time as well in episode 298, where we sit down together for a one-to-one -one interview. See you then.